Okay, good afternoon. Today we have uh, Ms. Amalia Hussein, who, or Hussein, Hussein, who will be talking to us about, I guess, microbial facilitation of the degradation of aromatic pollutants in the environment. Um, well, from what I am reading here, but let me just preface it by saying what I'm seeing here is that um, in the environment, we have a lot of degradative pathways for aromatic pollutants, which are some of the most toxic pollutants now. And although the energetics of these reactions are favorable, the energy needed to send these reactants over what is called the activation energy barrier into, pro into degradative products is so high that even though the thermodynamics, which is one type of energetics, will tell you they're feasible, the kinetics militate against this happening. So microbes are known to facilitate these degraded pathways. So from what I can read here, and of course the, the, the speaker will amplify because some of these things are, are out of my purview. It seems as if she will be looking at mapping different pathways theoretically. Okay? Using, as is written here, the stoichiometry, which is the sort of three-dimensional shape of the pollutant and I guess the microbe and where they come together and the thermodynamics and I expect that she will find that the thermodynamics are dependent to a certain extent on the stoichiometry but we will, that tale is yet to come. And um, using the theoretical uh, mappings for different pathways she proposes to then, I assume, either get the optimum or compare what the, the theory tells us in an actual practical experiment. Her objective is listed at the end, and that is reconstruction using a computational model. Computers are now doing everything except walking and talking, and then validating it experimentally. Okay? So the wet work still has to be done. So, I'm looking forward to this. Without further ado, Amalia Hussein. All right, thank you very much, Professor Scott. Um, today, the name title of my presentation is Elucidation of Aromatic Degradation Pathways <coughs> by Possible Microbes. Uh, this research is being done in the Center for Biomedical <coughs> Engineering uh, Research. At, oh, sorry, the Center for Environmental Studies and Applied Life Sciences in the Biological Engineering yeah. Program. Yeah. Now, before we start, I would like to go through just a few definitions because I know it's a bit confusing. And also, let me please state that I'm not a chemist by, uh, by, by training yeah. or education, but chemistry is important for all aspects of life and it does integrate <coughs> the most types of research. Right? So, and I found this particular <coughs> area of research interesting. So. Any comments <coughs> would be welcome. Right. Now, for some definition of terms that you may have seen in the brief summary or you may get to see in the upcoming presentation. Metabolomics, that's what uh, I think I had it originally as my title, but it's not changed. Suggest that because I'm using it for <coughs> separate types of analysis. Metabolomics is just a fancy word for analyzing a large range of organisms and their genomic information in those array of organisms, and it's usually organisms found in the environment, which is the bacteria I'm looking at, all right? Meta sorry, that's metagenomics. Now, metabolomics, I kind of went wrong, sorry. Yeah. Metabolomics is the study of metabolic pathways, all the metabolites in the world, and their concentrations. Now, remember, metabolites is not something that you could, um, you could, you could kind of fingerprint or say what it is what it is really. What you could do is use the stoichiometry and the spatial arrangement of metabolites <coughs> to be able to determine how much you have of one or how less you have of one. Then genomics, the study of genomes of organisms. Proteonomics, the study of the proteins, which is largely the enzymes, right? 
Now, before all this, let's start with how we got here. This study was actually, uh, it started from my master's or graduate work, where I looked, I was interested in bacteria that eat oil. Everybody knows about that. Bacteria that eat oil. And I found out that that technology is actually called bioremediation. Right? Where you find bacteria, indigenous microbes, that can eat degrade oil. But oil is a very complex compound made up of many different parts, alkenes, alkenes, which I'm sure as you know, probably be able to much easier. But the part that I was most interested in was polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which were toxic, uh, carcinogenic, genotoxic, meaning they form genetic mutations. And they were, hazard, uh, they, they were considered priority pollutants, and they have a tendency to bioaccumulate in nature. And another bad thing about pH is, is that they're semi volatile So it can be absorbed through your skin, you can inhale it. If it comes in contact with you, you know, it easily gets into a biological system. And then bioaccumulates, and well, you know, there are some <coughs> forms to that. The, the thing that we really wanted to find out was if we could find an indigenous bacteria or microbes that could degrade these pHs, <coughs> degrade these pHs to, um, to less toxic forms, all right? Ideally, to carbon dioxide and water. Now, the pHs, as I defined here, I don't know if you can see it, but now, please. They're pointing right. Is there a point of device in this? Yes. Yeah. Is that the right one? No. Okay, never mind. But your pHs could be well above, which our research actually showed that it was above the levels that was accepted, even though TPH was well below. Now, what we found from our research, I'm just briefly going through the previous research to give an idea. We found that there were 69 strains of bacteria we were able to identify that could degrade these pHs. We found um, the metabolites that were produced by these pHs through degradation over a 23 day period, and we found out the rates of degradation. Now, this is what the pHs that we found looks like. And if you notice, Burkle's area occupies the majority that we found. It was like 60%. This one called Diamona species and Leafsonia and Pinibasilis, they've never been found to be associated with pH degradation. So that was way awesome and cool. Well, for me, anyway. Right? Then, these were the range of metabolites we found associated with the degradation of the pHs. And this was isolated 23, which is also a very good area, right? And what we found strange though, when we went and we were looking at the pathways that degrades pHs, none of these um, metabolites were found as any kind of intermediate or any kind of subgrouping in <coughs> metabolic degradation. So obviously, it is a uh, byproduct of one of the pHs, based on their names alone, you could tell benzene, naphthalene, water, but they're not finding it in any of their metabolic pathways, which we'll come to shortly. So we wanted to find out what was this unique process that was taken. And again, let's look at the brickled areas here. You'll see the majority. What I have represented here is like the ones that will show the highest rates of degradation. And this one here, isolate 7 here, showed the highest rate of degradation of 0.36 parts per million per day degradation of the pHs. We did five pHs at this time. It was naphthalene, ace naphthalene, antracene, phenantrin, and pyrene, right? And this is just an average overview, okay? Now, so we have, so what we found in total was that these 69 strains of bacteria, mostly the book of areas, 
We have metabolites, definite, we know that they're definite byproducts being produced of some kind of pH degradation. And we know that the rates of degradation show that Burkholderia seem to be the one that is leading the way for degradation, right? Next. But what was not found? We couldn't, figure out, we couldn't figure out what the end products of degradation were. And ideally, we don't want to put something into a bioremediation system that doesn't work, and that you don't want it to go to something even more toxic, like the arene oxide, I don't know that properly. There is more toxic than the pollutants. So you want to make sure that it degrades the carbon dioxide and water. And you also want to know what pathway did they take? How did they get to this point? What, what compounds are being formed, you want to be able to map it. Because it's just important in being able to understand the genomics of the organism as well as, as, well as the metabolomics, right? Now, this, this leads up to our present study. So we have the idea. We want to know how to define this pathway. Now, Professor Ofta, hi. I went to him with this idea. Yeah, that's and... professor, but man, professor. Pardon? <laughs> yes, we do. Professor Ofta? Yeah, because I would confuse the language of the professor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, Professor Ofta, I went to him with the idea of pathway elucidation, right? And um, he, he, he told me about something that he had done previously in his, in his well, previous research, in that he had worked with Genomatica and with Paulson Research Group where they were able to do metabolic computational models. Now, I've never heard of this, and so it was very exciting to me, the idea of being able to do this through computers to be able to determine a metabolic pathway. Because previously, the way they would elucidate a metabolic pathway is do, like uh, Professor Scott was saying, you do the kinetics and the thermodynamics, and it's long, arduous, tedious, and really and truly, most people just work on one reaction for an entire PhD. Sometimes they don't do an entire pathway. But I wanted to know everything. I don't have the patience to find out one reaction at a time. I wanted to know the entire picture. Does it or does it not? Can it or can it not be used, this microorganism, as a bioremediation organism? That's what I want to know. And does it go to carbon dioxide and water? And what path does it take? And how does it relate to my other organisms? All sorts of questions. And I wanted an answer. And it seems that computational model, modeling took us there. Now, using computational models, they're, been, they're, they're called also genome-wide metabolic models because when you use a computational model, you need to know the entire genome of that microorganism, microorganism or organism. <laughs> and so far, they've been able, as of 2008, I'm sure it's increased a bit, but I was funny able to find that. But as of 2008, we had at least six organisms that have been validated. And validated means that they made this theoretical computational model and they were able to change both, both uh, conditions or whatever conditions. And what you would get at the end of the day, are, yeah, what you would get at the end of the day is that you'll be able to actually validate. When you add that media, you'll be able to get this amount of um, whatever product that you're looking for as a case may be. In the case of um, genome-wide metabolic models for E. coli, they were they, that that was the first one that Paulson and his group did, and they were able to take E. coli and predict actually the the kind of food, change the media, the, the type of food that they're putting in, and get the predict the amount that was also coming out. Hope I'm explaining that pretty well. But basically, <laughs> they could manipulate it how they needed to, and you can see lots of uses uses for something like this. You would use it for terms, in terms of media optimization if you want to, for example, you know, antibiotics, probiotics, all these things are very important. Even when you're making um, different compounds, we need to be able to do this on large scales using bioreactors. Now, when we do this, we need to simulate and see what kind of biomass that we're getting. And it's very important that we're able to optimize it. So you want to put in as least amount of material as possible and get as much output as possible. Um, the one that I'm interested in is metabolite or protein production, and that I want to see what metabolites are being formed, I want to see how quickly they're being formed, and what pathway they're taking to, be, to, to form them. And uh, we use something called flux balance analysis to do this, which I'll get to in a moment. This can also be used in terms of forming drug targets. If you know what pathway something is taking, especially for antibiotics, you could like delete or suppress a gene expression or add in some kind of operon expression and be able to manipulate a pathway how you need it to be manipulated so that you get the product that you're looking for. Right? 
Now, there are different ways of doing computational models. And this is what I found. You see Petrinax, and I'm just going to try this one completely. I understand plus power to us, but this is the four different ways that um, literature shows that you can also create computational analysis. Now, let me just go to flux balance analysis. That was one of the first ways that they started doing computational mo models by Paulson group in the US, and he kind of started paving the way with the E. coli model. Since then, people have been having spin-offs and have been developing other models of building on it. And that's where we got Petrinet, which is a formal graphical technique that allows you to map discrete systems. And um, then we have the Pi calculus, which was developed in France. This is algebra, originates from algebra, and usually describes concurrent computer processes in different languages, and usually represents proteins as processes, interactions, and allows for synchronous communications among processes, and they're called handshakes. Hand and cheeks, it's like hand cheeks. Hand cheeks. cheeks, yeah. And then we have state charts, which is agent based methods developed in Canada, who also develop using some of our And um, this model can be used for simulation, visualization of biochemical processes. And it is usually used to model biological processes such as T cell activation for the AIDS virus. <coughs> now, there are also this, these same people in Canada. They're also using sims since it's a simulated environment. People use like they simulated their real life. It's a game. It's an online kind of gaming. Method. But they're using that that same technology or the same algorithm behind that to actually simulate metabolism because they want to be able to put in constraints and say, well, this is what will happen. This is the natural case or natural way in which things would happen. But that's a new technology coming out and not quite there. Yet. But that's where it's going. And everything gets interlinked at some point. Now we have genome-wide metabolism. Now, met each organism that we probably want to target usually has between 800 to 1,300 reactions. And of these reactions, 95 to about 99 contains proteins or enzymes that are genes. The rest can be non-genes. Um, right? Now these reactions are highly conserved among organisms, uh, across organisms. For example. If this organism uses, uh, uses A plus B to equal C, and that organism uses A plus B to equal C, usually the gene for that is the same in both organisms. So the genes are highly conserved among organisms and usually represent the same reaction. And that's an assumption we go with in when we're comparing organisms. <laughs> and as I was saying, there are too many reactions to obtain their kinetics involved. So I'm not going there. Um, I will, plus I'm not a chemist by nature, I'm not quite sure how to go about doing that. What we do, we obtain the stoichiometry of these reactions. And when we mean stoichiometry, we basically obtain how many carbons, nitrogens, oxygens, basically the amount of atoms that go into the organism, and how much come out, and in what way, right? And we run flux balance analysis. Now, flux balance analysis is a mathematical <coughs> way of analyzing metabolism. And the flux balance is basically when you know something goes in, if A plus B equals C and D, your flux balance is that you want to make sure that the amount going in equals the amount coming out. And if there's any uh, changes or shifts in that uh, number of stuff that's coming out or going in, you have a balance. You have a flux balance that might be one, two, three, whatever value it is. And that value adds up together to produce something called your biomass. Now, at the end of the day, everything has a fixed biomass. That's the assumption we go with. And uh, this biomass can be used for predicting the makeup of that model. Now, there are, let me just make sure, okay. So basically, what this flux balance analysis <coughs> answers the question, um, <coughs> given known available nutrients, known conditions, <coughs> Which set of metabolic fluxes maximizes the growth rate of an organism while preserving the internal concentration of the metabolites? Right? And there are three stages in developing this computational model using flux balance analysis. First, you create a metabolic network without gaps, then you add constraints to this model, and then you have something you add called the objective function, which is your mass balance. Basically, you put a function to your biomass. Right? Now, 
I'm just going to go into a little detail because this is kind of the basis that we're using for our model development, right? Now, the metabolic network that forms the basis for the flux balance analysis ready network is that it contains no gaps. Now, creating this model is basically creating equations, upon equations for every gene that you have. Now, remember, you have like 1,200 genes per organism. And with that, gene, every gene is associated with it, a reaction. And remember, each gene usually produces an enzyme or protein, well, protein, that that gene is responsible for. So what you need to do is manually curate all that, find all the genes, find all the reactions, find all the enzymes involved. And not only find that, <laughs> you need to find out what kind of flux is associated with it. Is it negative, is it positive, that kind of thing, right? Now, after you've created this entire, let's just say, you finished creating your entire model, you found all your genes, you found all your, you fixed all the gaps that you could possibly get. What you need to do then, and usually you can get a lot of the information from one line, a fair amount, like a, at least a basic template, but I would say about 70% of the work is actual manual curation will be in the literature for each particular gene or each particular reaction. So it's a lot of manual curation and searches on the net and reading. Now, once you've done that, you could use pathway tools to be able to create this big metabolic <coughs> pathway, because in all this information, I'll be able to tell you using algorithms, known for them alone, that they'll be able to tell you what, and what kind of constraints you have, they'll be able to tell you what kind of pathways we developed. You can use these four IFR pathway tools, Symphony, Cell Designer, MetNet Maker. Personally, I want to use Symphony because that's what Paulson and his group use, and that's what was first developed on, that was the platform. The rest are usually just spin-offs of it, but as you can see, the price there does not allow me do that. So for now, I am investigating pathway tools and method maker, which is kind of okay, but not as user friendly as I would like it to be. After you've created these models, these 2D kind of models, what you could do is use biopacks and SBML formats so that you can get a nice 3D, 3D overview of what it really looks like to be able to manipulate it, get the graphics and that kind of thing. Okay. Now two, the constraints. Now whenever you create, you're creating any kind of metabolic model, you need to be able to put constraints. Uh, uh, you need to say that only so much media can go in and only so much can leave. These are the, the limitations of this. So you have nutrients, and then the flux through, the, through which the reactions occur within that organism. You need to put in those constraints as well. And these can be the constraints have a different set of uh, software tools that they utilize for that. Those are the Cobra toolbox, and the sorry, Cobra toolbox. Now, Cobra means constraints. Hold on, I'm going to make sure I get that correct. Constraints operated. Constraint based reconstruction and analysis. Right? And this. to be able to determine your constraints and to utilize the software. I'm still learning to use this toolbox. It's a bit complicated. And the learning curve has so far been quite slow. And then we have the objective function. In flux balance analysis, we require solutions to produce this desired metabolites in the correct proportion. This is called the objective function or, or biomass. And it is usually referred to as the biomass of the organism and it simulates growth and reproduction. It plays an important role in making the results of flux balance analysis biologically applicable, in that it ensures that the correct proportions are maintained in predicting biomass production for that organism. Right? Now, so that is the whole idea of flux balance analysis. Now, from this, we decided, well, okay, we're going to use flux balance analysis, but what do we really want to find? And I made it very simple in terms of what I want to find. And that I want to determine what are the current pH degradation pathways. I want to find the bacteria and genes associated with pH degradation. I want to find the reactions associated and their fluxes. I want to identify all the gaps. I want to use software to create the model. And then I want to validate the model with experiments. Quite simple. And this is a summary of how we're going to do it. Now, right now, what I'm doing is that... What slide that was that one? You just read the other slide. I do have a slide. Okay. Just so I can refer back to it. 
when this is just Zemeckerans, I'm just showing you some of the gaps that are associated with it. If you notice, for this one, we have what, what enzyme is being produced, we even have what gene. So this is a perfect line of entry here. But in this case here, we have a missing gene, missing gene, and what we need to do is find out what gene is associated with this. Now, the fact is, because it's not here, does it need to say does it exist in the literature? It's probably there in the literature, but it just involves a manual looking, going and looking for that literature paper, finding it out, seeing what you could cross-reference it with, and seeing what you could find out. Because people don't usually put it into a database when they find it. It is probably there in the literature, so you really need to go through and look through it carefully and um, very carefully. Now, this is a little bit more information. This is uh, financial in the degradation pathway of financial, and these are just some of the compounds of it. When it goes to the enzyme, we're also interested in this, uh, because remember, when they're going through their degradation pathway, we want to know each reaction that it takes, what gene is associated with it, and what enzyme it utilizes. For example, well, dihydrophenantrine to phenantrine tree diol. What we know is that this reaction, this is from the front metabolites to this, right? So just the application. I would like to know what organism is producing it, but we know it has a gene, but we don't know what organism is doing it. Likewise, for this one, we don't have another organism, neither a gene, neither do we have for these two what the exact enzyme is or protein being produced. What we do is just have a general idea of what kind of grouping it belongs to. So it's, it's really important to find this. Now, for this particular set of uh, pH reactions, we had 200 pH reactions. Out of those 200, we only had 23 genes and 64 enzymes that we could have determined. The rest needs to be we need to go in and pull it in manually, look for it and curate it. And that is very tedious. Now about the pHs. Previously, there were 16 priority pHs that were considered important. They were called the prior, 16 priority, but now they are 22 listed as priority pollutants. And um, I've listed 16 here for those who might be interested. Um, Degradation of pHs can happen by bacteria, fungi, plants, even photo oxidation, right? So that's sun and all that kind of thing. And that's important because now we're going to look and see what are the existing pathways for pH degradation. If you use the CAD database, which is a online database, they have a lot of information as well as the University of Minnesota Biocatalyst Biodegradation database. And what they did is that you found that even though you have 16 pHs and 32 as priority pHs now, only six pHs have actually been the actual pathway has been um, elucidated or determined, right? And these are anthracene, benzoepyrene, chlorine, naphthalene, phenantrene, and pyrene. So these are the most well studied and have been identified. And I'll go a little bit into detail into each of these, um, these pathways that has been um, elucidated. What this is, I know you can't say anything there, that's fine. I just wanted to show you how they're all interconnected. This is chlorine up here, anthracene, phenantrene, pyrene, and benzoepyrene, and this is naphthalene degradation going into, right? But they're all interconnected, meaning that their metabolites are all interconnected. And this leads into something called home metabolism. And that what you find is that if you put a bunch of pHs together and you put one bacteria, it will degrade much faster than all five, all five six, ten pHs will degrade much faster than if you have just um, one page be written by one page. Does that make sense? No. Okay. It's all Well, I understood what you said. It but just, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's, well, it's counterintuitive. Okay. But no, I understand. But it's it's happens. Happens. I said that you, you said that if you had one page and one organism. No, the other pHs actually assist. In the right. Degradation. You said that the, if you had several pHs with one microorganism, it would degrade faster than if you had just one pH and one organism. Yes. Right. When the yes, FA, yes. Right. So I understood that. Here you have the variety of Yes. <laughs> Remember, we have only one uh, possibly different from the It seems complicated. Go on. Go on. Well, I found I thought it was strange myself when I did for my, yeah. for my well, masters, but that's what happened. So this is the naphthalene pathway, and uh, the interesting thing about it is that this goes straight, I know it's very difficult to see, but I wanted to give you an idea, and this is mostly for Natasha, I know she wants to see structures. 
So I was like, let me bring in the structures because I was just going to use the words. But it basically degrades from naphthalene into this practical form, which is easier to degrade and goes through natural pyruvate or benzoate pathways into their end format. And these bacteria here, yeah, Bacillus, Pseudomonas, they're the ones that actually initiate these pathways and, and take it right through this process. Now, there are many bacteria that are associated with naphthalene degradation, but these four here yeah, that have been identified, these four that have been identified they are the ones that actually take it through this entire, they follow through this entire path. Now we know for a fact that ours don't seem to follow any of these pathways because we didn't find any of these products in our metabolites so far. Right? right, this is the phenanetrine and likewise the same thing. It goes to the tylate and the pyruvate pathways eventually, their end products are. And this is kind of how it breaks down in the process. You guys might understand chemistry a little better than I would, all right? And again, we have at least five, sorry, we have we have five five organisms here that are associated with initiating and completing this entire pathway. We'll, I'm quickly going to go through, androcene goes through two. Also, no, I did not include fungal metabolism here. This is only bacteria, all right? And for this one, we have five as well. Excuse me, Amanda. Pathways obtained by computational analysis and then verified no, experimentally. No, these are pathways that have been done by experimental traditional ways okay. and they've okay. been loaded onto a database. Okay. The ones that there haven't been any pH degradation that have been done by computational analysis okay. as yet. Right, so, this is what has been done traditional way. Okay. Right. And then we have chlorine, which has like three different pathways. And it goes again salicylic acid here and salicylic here. And I'm not sure what that component is there. And this is some aldehyde, right? And then we have our pyrene, which is extremely toxic as well. Now, I don't know if I mentioned it, but the more rings a pH has, the more toxic it is. Mm -hmm. Alright? So this is pyrene, which is fairly toxic and carcinogenic, along with and they have many strains of bacteria that seems to degrade this. And know. others. I hate to interrupt you again, but um, it's important at this point to understand this. These pathways, are these pathways suggested by multiple authors, by different authors? Yes. Right, so in other words, these are competitors for what is actually happening, as opposed to this is definitely the pathway. Because you see, the different authors may have proposed different pathways. But the question is, has it been accepted that pyrene will go through two pathways? Or is it one set of waters we need to go through no. one pathway and the other set of waters we need to go through another pathway? No, what I what I didn't explain here is though is that these uh, because I just put all bunched all the bacteria together. Good. What they were able to do is actually um, determine that well, for different bacteria. For different bacteria, this pathways. is the pathway, and for different bacteria, right. this is okay. the pathway. Good. And that was elucidated, and it's, it's accepted right. because okay. it's in an international database. Right. This is the CAD database. But now what you mentioned it's different bacteria, yeah. it makes sense. Yeah, it's not all these bacteria. Some go through pathway one, and some go through pathway two. Okay. I'm yeah. just explaining right. it well, does that's how it goes. Right. And this is benzo A pyrene. And this is how it breaks down as well via these three particular strings. And they all, I would like to stress, they all initiate as well as follow through this entire pathway. What you would find is that there are many bacteria out there and organisms that actually do little in reactions in between. They might be involved with this reaction alone, but that isn't included in these sets of organisms. These organisms are the ones that carry it straight through to the end product. And in this case, it's the carbon dioxide, which is perfect for those in pathway one. Right? Which is what we were looking for. Okay. Now, when you find, when we finally find what our pathway is, and we find out our range of reactions, remember there's a gene associated with it, and this is Ralstonian degrading naphthalene. And these little things here, they're genes, and when you do genomic analysis, this is kind of what it looks like. So we have naphthalene degradation, de degrading organism here with their genes. And then we have Ralstonian. What we're looking at is that we see that this particular gene matches. We see that this H17 and C, they all match. 
which is good. It means to say that most likely Ralstonia species U2 has naphthalene degrading capabilities. But the important thing with doing computational metabolic modeling is that something may have the capability, but it may not be expressing itself. We could manipulate that model so that it expresses that particular gene. And that is kind of where, where I like the idea of computational modeling is that you're able to manipulate this thing as much as possible to be able to get the product that you so desire. Now, the whole idea of all of this, yes, I know it looks really confusing, but that's what I want to get to the end. I want something looking just like that in the end. This is like the I know. I want this, this is just metabolism for um, using the care metacyte database, and this is just normal, um, Carbohydrate metabolism expressed here, but this is kind of where I want to see when I see my my, my metabolic pathway. I want to be able to view it just like this, where each of these things mean something. But I don't want to go through and do each step of reaction by myself. I want a computer to do it for me, right? But I need to put it in a format that they would like. So that's where the work involves. Now. After we've gotten this computational um, model into a format that we could utilize, and we probably got there, let's assume we got to that point, we need to validate this model that it makes sense. So what I need to do is just update my literature, make sure my methods are still valid, because these are the same methods I'm going to use that I used to do in my master's. That's why it's, it's, it's very simple for me. Um, I need to characterize and isolate some pH degraders. Even though I have my old ones, I would like to redo it because I just want to redo it for the sake of my to understand the stringency and I'm not sure of the storage capabilities that you need since all that time has passed. So I would like to redo it and we have the, um, the capabilities here at UTT. I would also like to do degradation rates of products once I've identified what it is using uh, whole genome sequencing, which would cost probably about 4,000 TT dollars, um, US dollars, but hopefully easy to pay for it. You will cover it and make the shoes at the end. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and then I want to determine what are the products being produced. And it is from this manipulating what, how much pHs I give it and what is produced, I'll be able to tell using GCMS analysis. I'll be able to tell, hey, are you following my model or not? And if it is not following your model, that's still good news. Because then I can go and tweak my model and say, you know what, biomass is supposed to be so much. Or metabolite production is supposed to be so much. And that can also help in the iterative improvement of that particular problem. Right? And that's pretty much where we are. At this point, I need to continue filling in the gaps. I need to improve the literature I'm finding. My I need to continue the manual iterative searches. I really need to learn how to use these pathway tools, cell designer, MathNet, MathLab. There's a bioinformatics tool in MATLAB, but MATLAB is it's just a lot of programming and it's not my uh, background, so I'm having a field day with that. And I still need to continue doing the model definition and model validation. I would like to, and that's about it for my presentation, I would like to thank Professor Br 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 Dr. Brian Hunter-Hai, Professor Sharaf, Dr. Rennie Williamson, Candice Chankin, and the biomedical engineering team that always supports me all my ventures and all the research activities in our department. I'd also like to thank Dr. Ali Franzberg and Dr. Uma Haran, who continues to assist in the development of this project because they were my past supervisors from my last project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions, comments? I have. Um, I have